Morning, folks. We have the early birds, I see. Okay, but there's um, only 36 of you now out of 76 enrolled. Um, so I guess a lot of more people are going to pile in. Um, let's straight away, just so I know who actually makes the effort to get out of bed on time. Um, let's just put seven in the chat straight away. Um, of course, everyone else can do this later on too, but... Uh, uh, you get you guys get date stamped, time stamped as being the organized people. Right. I fear some of you have been up all night um, doing homework for other classes. Hopefully you've had some sleep. Right. Oh, okay. I see a few names there. I want to single out a couple of people. People like uh, Maho, for example. Um, Masan uh nutty who did spectacularly well on the quiz 19 out of 20 both of you yesterday that's um an awesome result um and a number of others of you did very very well as uh two um so by the way i uh, put the questions to 20 rather than 15 i had originally flagged 15 but um uh, when I was making them, I actually got thinking that, you know, there, there is an element of just kind of falling on certain things in the text and whatnot. Um, and there are plenty of people who really master other parts and then think, oh, they didn't get a question about this. So I'm, I'm, I'm always torn. Um, people are intimidated by more questions rather than fewer. Um, yet there's actually, uh, there's this, arguably it's fairer to have more questions rather than fewer because he, um, each question is actually uh, worth less. Uh, so... I'll kind of flip flop on flip flop on that. Um, when uh, when there's a lot of things that I can ask questions about, I might make it twenty. Otherwise, other times I make it fifteen. But um, the critical thing doesn't change that the quiz is just weighted at five percent. So whether it's a third of a mark or of a quarter of a mark for each one, um, it doesn't really um, make a difference. I just want to apologise for the uh, delayed launch on it yesterday. I had it set up and then I realised that um, I'd um, done something silly technically and uh it wasn't going to function as it was supposed to so uh but just kind of a last minute double check on it discovered the problem and then there was some considerable mucking around to uh fix it uh so sorry about that okay um i noticed that uh the vast majority of people uh took it as usual which is which is good and uh the average was um about 11 and a half nearly 12 about 11 i think um and so yeah not not bad some people did spectacularly well some people answered in three minutes and got four out of four out of 20 and whatnot i i, I just guess they they wanted to show that they're engaged but they hadn't had a chance to read the book never mind onwards and upwards okay each one is only five percent and uh there's plenty of scope to uh uh to catch up later in the semester um it's obviously fairly at this stage weighted towards the text um that's quite deliberate i think it's it's an excellent book and um gives us a really good background both in terms of some fundamental historical knowledge uh, anyone in business in america for example knows all about the uh, the big names you know the likes of jp morgan and vanderbilt and uh, carnegie and whatnot and those quite nuanced stories on the one hand being described as robber barons and on the other hand having um, made enormous contributions to cultural institutions libraries educations carnegie foundation for example is really striking andrew carnegie was um quite ruthless at times in suppressing industrial action and yet gave away literally in in those terms um hundreds of millions of dollars which these days would add up to many billions of dollars so a long tradition there and uh so we see people like bill and melinda gates giving away a very large substantial proportion of their enormous wealth um is part of an established uh, American culture of entrepreneurship, of giving back. Um, there are lots of nice anecdotes in the book, for example. Um, we see the, uh, and there was a question on it, the integration of the newly wealthy into old elites in places like Philadelphia. Uh, the uh, Wharton Business School, for example, got its name from a guy called Wharton, the founder of the Bethlehem Steel Company, um, which is a, a huge enterprise. And uh, so we see this in so many instances. Um, Kellogg School of Business, of course, no surprise, um, associated with the family, with the uh, Kellogg cornflakes and whatnot. Uh, so we look around, we see in many instances. The money doesn't just flow into uh, business education, although that is one of the really striking features of America, and I'm going to say more about that. 
um, that from very early on, um, there was a strong recognition that um, these huge corporations um, obviously couldn't be run day to day by the founder. Uh, you know, the, the scale of the business was so enormous that they need a very um, uh, large scale, high quality um, managerial class of people. Um, high quality in terms of their knowledge, their skill base and whatnot. Um, and so that the education system had to work for that. So we see a lot of wealthy entrepreneurs directing their um, philanthropy towards um, educational foundations, universities, school programs and whatnot. You know, someone like Andrew Carnegie, who um, goes to work at 13 because his parents were dead poor, were driven out effectively of Scotland by the uh, the Industrial Revolution, which completely displaced his father um, as a traditional weaver. Um, his mum really brought in uh, much of the money. Um, so people like him very clearly understood that uh, inequality of access to education was going to have a really profound impact on the supply of um, talented employees uh, for a large enterprise. And so very strong focus on, you know, in, in terms of the interests of business, but also in some kind of philosophical sense, um, quality of access to education. So this is one of the, uh, the striking things in the United States. On the one hand, the, uh, the, the discourse of liberalism and free enterprise, of weariness about the state, and yet a very strong recognition that business needs as quid pro quo to actually give back uh, to society. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about America and uh, I'll get on with that first. And then I'll turn to a discussion of um, disruption and group exercise and a whole bunch of things. Okay, so let me go straight over to the lecture slides that I started last week and didn't um, finish. I'll go fairly quickly through these for the very simple reason that um, the issues have been well covered by the book and that you will have read the chapter quite thoroughly, um, precisely because we had the, uh, the quiz on it yesterday. Okay. So I'm running it off the, uh, the PDF. Uh, I might use the keynote for the next one, but anyway. So I want to consider America in the context of settler capitalisms, and I'll come back to this again. You're gonna see exactly the same slide when I talk about um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and whatnot, and uh, come some comparisons with um, other colonial settlement projects such as in Latin America, because they lead to very different economic outcomes. But the emphasis again, we talked about the scale of America um, and this striking um, period of, Amer of America's Gilded Age, which was a source of you know, uh, creating of enormous wealth and at the same time um, striking inequality. And uh, effectively, this is a tale of from the mid 19th century into the early 20th century, the, uh, the successive um, rapid growth of uh, industries which effectively provide the infrastructure of the modern economy. So first of all, of course, uh, fuel, uh, oil, but initially in the, in the form of kerosene, uh, which is striking, the standard oil company and whatnot, later on with the, uh, the development of the internal combustion engine and particularly its application to the motor, motor vehicle and whatnot, that, that creates a second huge um, oil expansion. Uh, the uh, growth of the railways and tied with the railways, the growth of the steel industry and these in increasing economies of scale is one of the really striking stories about uh, America. One of the statistics in the book there was that um, Carnegie Steel uh, through in process innovations were able to roll more steel in one day um, by the end of the 19th century than a steel mill could produce in a year, in uh, only 30 or 40 years back. So the transformational role of the application of technology at scale, um, bringing costs down dramatically. Um, again, in the, um, <coughs> excuse me, in the, uh, the text, the anecdote in relation to um, Eastman, the founder of the Kodak Camera Company, his first uh, camera cost something like $46, which was an enormous sum in those days. 
and he had to pay five dollars uh, to someone to teach him how to use the thing. And uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, the box brownie, which was the uh, the the equivalent of taking a selfie uh, these days with your smartphone, uh, became absolutely ubiquitous, and it cost a dollar. So absolutely uh, transformative in terms of putting um, products in people's hands uh, at relatively low cost and enormous scale. And we can see this revolution happening in so many other places today as well too. If you uh, go into Uniqlo, for example, um, it's, it's easy to forget just how transformative uh, this has been. The combination of very efficient supply chain management so that you could produce most of your product offshore in a lower cost location, bring it in a very timely season oriented, uh, season sensitive kind of way um, into stores produce at a very consistent high quality. So taking advantage of cheaper labor elsewhere, but also machinery as well is absolutely critical to this. Knitwear, for example, and whatnot. Um, and uh, you know, next next time you're in Uniqlo or, so, or some other comparable store and you see uh, you know, a, a, a twin pack of two very finely made um, t-shirts, for example, I think this is, this may be Uniqlo, uh, Supima Cotton. Super nice cotton. Um, I think this is a thousand yen for one, a bit indulgent, but you can get two for two of us slightly lower specs for uh, 500 yen. Um, and keep in mind that a hundred years ago, uh, people had only a very limited uh, stock of personal clothes, personal possessions. And we, of course, you know, um, in, in an often environmentally problematic way, uh, are just engaging, obviously, almost kind of thoughtless consumption because these things are just so uh, ridiculously cheap. Um, I myself am a little bit guilty of having thrown away um, t-shirts when I've been traveling uh, when I realized that the cost of actually having a t-shirt um, washed by the uh, the hotel uh, laundry service is going to be rather more expensive than buying a new one when I, at, at Uniqlo or Muji when I get back to Tokyo and uh, not wanting to carry dirty clothes, kind of throw it away and think, hmm, this is environmentally kind of terrible. I do hope that the cleaning ladies are going to use them as uh, as cleaning rags or something. But uh, we see this extension of scale to so many fields bringing down costs. There's already an article on the course website, um, which talks about uh, the future of capitalism in, in an age of um, mass uh, production and AI. Uh, that's the Adair article, and uh, I'll draw your attention to it later on. Uh, he really emphasizes, and he's the head of a former, uh, he's the former head of a, uh, a major regulatory body, a financial regulatory body in the in the UK. Um, someone very respected um, in UK policy circles in relation to economy and regulation. He very much emphasizes that the application of technology to mass production now has come uh, to such a scale that the marginal cost of an additional unit of something approaches zero. Um, it's, not, it's not completely zero, it's never completely zero, but the, but the costs fall to some incredibly low level. And to the point actually where uh, that kind of interim process, for example, in the clothing industry of seeking lower costs offshore by moving say your production to China, a combination of IT enabled and um, lower labor cost enabled mass production, but that actually is likely to become rather less common for the very simple reason that more and more of, of what we consume is com completely automated in its production. We see, for example, a major German shoe manufacturer bringing sneakers, uh, the manufacturer of them back to Germany. Uh, you may have noticed this boom in, in woven sneakers effectively. That's kind of like a very fancy sock, okay? <laughs> Um, attached to a base, uh, they're completely machine made. So you really don't need humans involved in them other than to put them in the boxes at the end. And so we'll see the return of more and more production actually to higher cost locations in terms of labor costs, uh, but closer to market, closer to the innovation. And effectively, what we're saying is that the offshoring advantage uh, tends to be diminished as we go ever further in terms of replacing people uh, with machines. Offshoring to, cheap, to, to access cheaper labor 
uh, really was an interim thing because the machines weren't as uh, yet well developed. So the railways uh, very much in the United States function to a remarkable degree like the internet does today. We, we can think of this as the, uh, the critical mechanism for connecting people, for creating new business opportunities. Um, the Sears Robux, Robux uh, fortune becomes a very famous Sears department store, um, but effectively it was a catalog, catalog seller. Sears, as the book talks about, he was uh, working as a uh, railway shipping agent. So that's someone who effectively um, books cargo um, and, and also tickets for people in some circumstances, uh, effectively is a booking agent for putting things on the railways. And there were long periods of tedium because he was in a small town somewhere along one of the tracks somewhere. And a uh, shipment of watches came in and the local jeweler didn't want to buy them. He was entrepreneuring. He picked them up himself cheaply, sold them down the line to other people doing a similar role. I uh, thought this does pretty well, then partnered with a, uh, a watchmaker in Chicago, um, a guy called Robo. And then they moved into the catalog business. And this was a very significant means of selling product really right up in, into the, uh, the 1960s and even the 1970s, that people in more remote areas would buy a large proportion of what they needed actually from catalogs. So it grew into hundreds and hundreds of, of um, products uh, with mass distribution. So effectively, it was the reliability of the railways that was able to get the product out there in the first place that allowed this uh, selling model. So it's no surprise that, of course, Amazon uh, captures a similar kind of scale. Uh, all that is, is really a digital version of the old catalog selling. By the way, some of the people who really made a name for themselves in the advertising industry, and particularly David Ogilvy, for example, um, Ogilvy and um, Mather, and one of the great pioneers uh, of advertising in America after World War II, they got their career start writing copy effectively for catalogs that uh, to sell a product in an, in an era when people couldn't really experience the product and then you had only a literally sketchy, a sketchy sketch of the product, pun intended, um, meant that the, uh, the catcher copy, so the copy to actually sell the product was very significant. So copywriters were doing this on massive scale selling you know in these catalogs were, were literally hundreds of products for sale so writing that bit of knockout copy which you then put on they say a full um, advertisement in the new york times or something like that was just really just a, a distribution or scaling up of a message that was done at a micro level um, on mass uh, through catalog uh, selling the development of the railways has a huge impact on spatial dynamics in the United States, particularly the settlement of the Midwest and uh, later on the Far West. And let's have a look at those maps, okay? Um, these maps here, hopefully you look through them. I, I did warn you in advance to have a look at them. And um, we need to remind ourselves of how the United States actually grew over time with the, in, the effectively integration of territories. Um, and in a sense, the American project is not completely finished because there's the ongoing question of what are states and what are territories. And there is a serious push now for Puerto Rico to become a state um, and also for Guam um, and the Marinaras uh, to become another state uh, in the United States, which would be a very interesting uh, proposition. And so we can see, of course, that um, the United States literally goes through a combination of colonial expansion, effectively, territorial expansion, and uh, through deals. Alaska is bought from the Russians, uh, quite literally. I'm, I'm sure the Russians absolutely regret uh, doing that deal as a consequence. So we uh, need to remind ourselves, though, that before the railways came along, before the technology of the steam engine and Robert Louis Stevenson very famously and you can see his famous train it's all in uh, your high school textbooks the rocket um, if you get to uh, go up to uh, northern England you can see it in a museum near Derby and before you had the steam engine on steel wheels running on tracks uh, there was water water was the main way to transport things um, for all of you who can swim and enjoy swimming and better still actually floating, nothing um, as nice as 
floating on your back, not on your front. Um, float on your front if you've got a goggle and snorkel is, is absolutely wonderful. Floating face down doesn't, doesn't go very well. Normally you did um, or you will be. So floating on your back, uh, there are lots of people who can't float because they, they kind of panic, okay? And they think they're gonna sink. Um, if you think you'll sink, you will. That's the basic rule. It's like with a bicycle. If you think you're gonna fall off, you will. If you are confident in knowing that if you put your head back and float, uh, you can float all day. Uh, that, that is a tip if you do fall off a ship by chance, okay? Just float till they find you, okay? Um, so the old notion of uh, when, when, when someone is soaring with a saw, let the saw do the work, okay? Don't overdo it, okay? In a similar kind of way, don't fight the water. Let the fighter do the, let, let the water do, do the work for you, float. Um, the simplest way to move a heavy thing from one place to another was to float it, okay? To put it onto a barge, onto a raft. Um, in the case of logs, for example, the simplest thing to do was to actually let them float themselves. And this was uh, a key factor in the development of urban spaces in Japan, that the uh, logs, the marutan, uh, would be floated down the river and typically was actually stored in the water and then they would haul them out of the water and then dry them out and then cut them and use them. And by the way, that also meant that um, if you did ever have a uh, typhoon or something, uh, you could end up with a real tragedy because there's nothing more uh, dangerous than a flood with a whole bunch of logs rolling through and they, they literally would kind of do the equivalent of steamrolling the, uh, the city. So there was this very clear recognition throughout history that um, using waterways was a very efficient way to transport things. And where there weren't waterways, you could actually make them. So they would actually mobilize large numbers of people to literally dig canals. And you can still see these canals in China in England and uh, the South of France. And we see a similar thing, um, similar approach in the US. Uh, major rivers, such as we can see the Mississippi River running all the way down here and the, uh, the iconography of the, uh, the steamboat um, is really about uh, the application of steam to waterways. The steamboat was a revolutionary development, the paddle steamer, for the very simple reason that it can go in any direction. It could go upstream um, quite readily. Um, anyone who does sailing knows that you you can go upstream sailing, but that you have to tack, okay? Um, use the breeze. And uh, that actually is fairly time consuming and a narrow waterway is actually quite dangerous. Um, so the steam engine effectively uh, brought the best of both ways, best of both worlds. And it's only subsequently when the combination of the application of steam technology to making good roads in the form of the steamroller, we call it a steamroller, literally, uh, because it was a roller driven by steam with a big, very heavy roller, so they could crush down a bed of uh, rocks and whatnot and make very solid flat roads. So a combination of that, uh, the use of the stagecoach, so relatively low tech in a sense, uh, but having quite a number of horses with well-made um, coaches that had some fairly modern technology. Um, we think the stagecoach looks ancient. We think of this image of a cart, you know, that goes right back to Roman days or something. Um, but the, uh, the mid to late 19th century stagecoach was actually quite sophisticated. The horses were pulling it. Um, but if you looked at the fine details of how it was made, they had shock absorbers in it. They had um, iron shock absorbers, which made for significant dampening over rougher roads, which made it a bearable trip. Uh, it wasn't in the past. You'd be shaken horribly with, until they had shock absorber technology. Um, the uh, ability to actually process rubber um, to use again as a shock absorber was quite critical. Uh, so many of the metal fittings and whatnot involved to have all of those horses um, with all the quite literally horsepower. We still use um, a measure of the power of an engine. Uh, we talk about horsepower uh, related to um, what weight you could drag with horses. And even into the, well into the 20th century, we see horses being used um, in military purposes uh, during World War I. Um, horses were typically used, for example, to drag uh, guns, cannons into place to haul large amounts of cargo, um, simply because they could navigate um, imperfect terrain. 
So uh, we see this gradual application of new technologies uh, to existing practices, which actually prolongs the use of them. Uh, I'll give a simple example, contemporary example of this. Um, EV is going to spread very dramatically and very quickly. Partly governments are really pressuring uh, in some places to get rid of the internal combustion engine. But, uh, and it is unquestionably the future, but also quite strikingly, the um, existing system of the internal combustion engine is also quite a sustainable technology for a while for the simple reason that the technology has become so much more advanced so that we can use this leg legacy technology um, because it is continuously being improved as well. For example, the emissions from a typical, the, the emissions, high gas, um, certain measures of it, from a typical car engine today are about one 250th of what they were um, in the early 1970s. So one car running today, um, the particulates that it issues, uh, the pollution there um, is the, uh, about 250 cars today, the equivalent of what one was um, in the early 1970s. So technology is disruptive very significantly, but also technological innovation can also keep certain existing technologies um, and practices and systems uh, viable for longer. That's uh, a critical point. And the clearest evidence of this is um, Uber Eats. Uh, if you stop and think about it for a moment, on the one hand, it's, it's so 21st century, you know, being able to on your phone very quickly order a meal and have it delivered to you in a timely fashion. Yet, remember what this fundamentally is. This is someone on a bicycle delivering us food, okay? Uh, what an archaic thing. It is a fundamentally archaic thing. And yet, of course, uh, we look at the, uh, the bicycles people are using, they're, also, they're either using the Docomore share bikes, okay? Again, they're using their phone and an app to, to, uh, to use the thing, or someone who's a very serious cyclist is on um, a uh, very precise, you know, a high precision instrument, um, some bicycles can cost more than, than um, a small car these days, uh, a new car, if you're really a, like a hardcore maniac. But uh, even if you just spend uh, Jumanen or whatever, you can get yourself a nice carbon fibre frame and uh, quite a sophisticated bike. And of course, what's striking with the, in, was striking with the growth of uh, Uber Eats is that so many of the riders don't even actually have to have very good Japanese here, for example, because they're using their smartphones um, and they can find the addresses on Google Maps and they can toggle that into um, uh, different English, uh, dif different language interfaces and whatnot. So new technological applications gives new life to um, old technologies in interesting ways. Um, if anyone wants to get a sense of this early period of the, uh, the canals and then the steamboats and whatnot, you only have to go to um, Disney and uh, ride the wild, well, it's not wild west, it's, it's more the south, um, it's all kind of mashed up in Disney, Disney view of the world, uh, the ride there with the, uh, the fake steamboat and whatnot, uh, and it's all, you know, as if we're down in Louisiana or somewhere. So the numbers are really quite striking in terms of railway growth, okay. Um, 10 times um, the size in merely 20 years, but we see the usual kind of coordination problems, no standardized railway gauge, um, lots of different competing standards, different entrepreneurs. These legacy effects continue for the longest time. Um, airport, uh, sorry, air travel in Australia um, had a huge advantage for the very simple reason that when the railways were created in the 19th century in Australia, they were done on a state basis. And so each state had different railway gauge. The tracks were literally different widths, okay? So uh, this uh, really hampered the development of uh, speedy rail services. And the biggest thing that it hampered uh, in the Australian case, and this was up until the 1990s, there was because there was no uniform railway gauge, you could not uh, cost effectively transport cargo around the country through the railway system. Everything went on trucks because if it was put on the trains, you actually had to then unload the trains and reload them onto um, other trains at the border where the railway ga gauge changed in size. Um, in my particular state, Brisbane, because it wasn't too far from the New South Wales border, they solved this problem by laying a separate track 
um, on the New South Wales gauge, uh, just up so far as Brisbane. So you could get on a train and leave from Brisbane and go all the way to Sydney rather than having to change at the border like you used to have to. The Americans sorted this out um, a lot earlier, but we see that they so sorted it out with the likes of JP Morgan, who effectively um, takes major controlling stakes in lots of railways and forces them to collaborate, uh, to coordinate. Uh, we do see that on some of the really big infrastructure, the state plays a critical role in terms of providing the legal foundation to cross state lines, uh, providing financial incentives, Union Pacific, Central Pacific here, for example, putting tracks right out um, across to California um, to unify the nation uh, become critical. Now, one of the, uh, the big issues, for example, is when you lay down infrastructure, you create um, increased value around it. Uh, again, in the Australian case, we're seeing a huge political fight right now because they're building a um, second airport out in the western, um, the far western suburbs of Sydney because the uh, inner city airport's kind of crowded. And some people have got a very good deal. They had farms that weren't very much worth very much in that area. But as, when you bring a big new international airport with cargo capabilities and whatnot, suddenly your land becomes very valuable. So at what price um, should you be paid for your land? So of course, should you be paid the improved value, particularly when the state is providing the infrastructure? Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs are focused on this. There's a long history of this, um, of integrated developments that tried to capture the full value of the increase of land through providing the infrastructure. So most of the railways that, that many people would use other than JR coming in from the suburbs into Tokyo, the private lines all are based on this model. You know, the likes of Keo or uh, Cebu, for example, fully integrated business model where you lay down the infrastructure, you have um, Tokyo still is a major player in real estate developments. For example, Tokyo's business model was um, you develop the, uh, the suburbs at the end of them and along the railway tracks. Um, you have retail spaces all along the line. You put department stores um, at the uh, end of the tracks. So you have your department store in Shinjuku and uh, Ikebukuro and uh, whatnot and Ueno. And uh, so effectively you capture the value that's created through having all of those people trafficking through that infrastructure and wanting to live through that convenient infrastructure. Um, America provides some of the early lessons on this. Uh, then the lessons were taken to the UK and we see significant developments with new towns and private railways and whatnot. And then those lessons were learned largely by the UK and brought to Japan. So those people who were savvy in terms of seeing what was happening in other states and in America and, uh, and then in the UK could see opportunities um, in other countries as well. This is something we'll come back to in terms of uh, the dynamics of empire and foreign investment as well. So what's very significant is that a lot of value creation is about connecting up different forms of transport, for example. So the railways and the lake shipping interface this makes Chicago. Chicago's on the Great Lakes, of course. Uh, the lakes were a hugely important mechanism for transporting goods. Uh, they're, of course, the joint property of both Canada and the United States. Um, we, we can see the patterns of railway development here through the, uh, here. We can see that uh, the notion of the Wild West, uh, the, uh, the expansion way out to the Pacific was a gradual process, but very much uh, filled the imagination of not just Americans, but uh, many Europeans. And so much of the market for novels, for example, Tales of the Wild West was actually a European market. Um, people who in, in the UK, for example, uh, not just schoolboys, but uh, the population at large, uh, found this absolutely enthralling, the, the notion of the wild frontier and the spirit of adventure and entrepreneurship. And this is so much part of the American DNA, but um, more broadly, how the world at large has perceived the United States. Now, of course, quite striking. Um, you have huge mountain ranges that have to be uh, navigated, for example. Um, the building of the railways, there are interesting issues of the sources of labor. There was quite systematic 
exploitation of Chinese labor, for example, that crossed the Pacific to come and work on the building of the, uh, the railways. So some, some very complex um, and contested histories. Um, we see over time, of course, the, uh, the adding of these railways and the sheer scale of the developments. Um, areas, for example, uh, if we look down around Texas, uh, were once quite um, disconnected in terms of transport. There was some coastal transport, of course, it would take things across to Florida um, or be shipped. Coastal transport was really significant for a long period of time, actually, to get things from, um, to make any kind of connection, to get from, say, Texas um, up to the uh, the northeast, if you're going to New York or Boston or whatever. People almost invariably did it as a sea journey rather than an overland journey. Um, then we see the expansion of the railway lines, um, the green ones, 1870, which mirrors what we've got there before. Okay. Um, and then the creation of uh, all of these other railway lines that were laid down in just 20 years. Now, you guys, most of you are around 20, so 20 seems a long time to you, but uh, you get to my age, 53, and 20 doesn't seem very much. Okay. Kind of blinked and my um, baby daughter turned uh, 25. Okay. Uh, so this really is quite uh, astonishing in terms of the speed in which this infrastructure uh, is developed. And uh, effectively, this allows the creation of large scale industries, not just to build the infrastructure, but um, in a sense, more seemingly traditional industries in terms of primary products. So the massive ex expansion of agriculture not only to feed populations back out east, uh, but to be able to transport crops such as uh, wheat, barley, um, pork bellies, okay? Um, that is a significant thing and you can actually trade in um, futures based on pork bellies on the New York, uh, what am I saying, the Chicago Board of Exchange. Chicago, where it sits here is on Lake Michigan. Uh, you can see the uh, through the Great Lakes, uh, you, the, these transport infrastructure was significant. So Chicago becomes a huge hub for the trading of agricultural commodities. Effectively, what you could do would be to get um, from the Midwest agricultural products, get it uh, to markets in the East and onto ships and to Europe. And uh, this meant that the economic returns to agricultural activity were dramatically increased. And so a lot of capital flowed, a lot of labor flowed there as well. And we go right out to the West, um, given the Mediterranean climate out there, this presents new opportunities, such as, for example, growing um, oranges, uh, grapes, a whole range of things. And uh, so we see uh, a significant flow of capital into those agricultural industries, orchard industries and various things, which again, were able to serve markets um, out to the east. Now we, we see this continuous process. We, we go through um, the development of the steam engine and this source of power that could be connected to so many things. Actually, my uh, great grandfather, or great, I'm lost, no, great, great, -grand, great, great grandfather, no, great, well, anyway, whatever, um, was a uh, Swedish um, steam engineer and he worked on ships because ships had steam engines and he got to Australia in the 1880s. So it must've been great, great grandfather, 1890s. No, I don't know. Anyway, who cares? Um, got to Australia and he had huge work opportunities. In fact, he, he uh, had arguments with the, uh, the captain of the ship and he uh, quit and uh, got off the ship in Adelaide. He was supposed to sail all the way back to Sweden, but he didn't. So he got off the ship in Adelaide and he literally worked his way um, halfway around the Australian continent and ended up settling as a farmer and becoming quite successful um, on the basis of his steam engine um, engineering capabilities. Because everything used steam in the days before um, electricity was wide, widely available. So the timber industry, for example, lumber, cutting timber, all done through using steam engines with um, transmission belts, which drove the, uh, the saws to cut lumber. Um, everything, even sh uh, sheep shearing, for example, had steam um, uh, engines supporting part of the process. 
So most factories used steam engines. And if any of you get to Sydney, for example, uh, you can't right now, um, but if you get to Sydney and you get to go to the Powerhouse Museum, the last working um, engine, huge uh, steam engine designed by a very famous guy called Watt, who gave us the, gave us the term, the Watts, um, is uh, working there. And you can see uh, just what a significant, no pun intended, uh, powerhouse, uh, quite literally, it was uh, to drive pretty much anything you wanted to attach to it, just we, like we would today with electric motors. Uh, the problem with electricity, of course, was the generation of electricity and the delivery of electricity, of course, through the transmission networks, which are very significant infrastructure. Now, in terms of actually closing distance, um, the internal combustion engine is ultimately revolutionary um, because you can put it on even more things. Uh, you can't effectively put a steam engine onto a bicycle. Uh, that'd be kind of interesting. I wonder if I'm sure some people have kind of tried that. That'd be kind of cool. Um, you can certainly put them onto a stable platform like a boat or onto a train. Um, and we have, you know, steam rollers and things like that. Um, but the internal combustion engine could be very, very small. And so this made it possible to make motorbikes, uh, to make light passenger vehicles, and then most significantly to make aircraft. Okay to be able to spin propellers fast enough, big enough propellers fast enough to actually achieve flight. This becomes absolutely transformational. Later on, the jet engine uh, is even more transformational. The, the uh, sheer power involved and uh, efficiency and the ability to travel great distances. And so these tables here just simply show some of the transformations um, and how the world becomes a smaller place in terms of journeys being made. Okay, so we look at small planes, um, their range. Um, these actually, 1938, these were used uh, during World War II quite significantly. Politicians would, um, when they went to international meetings, they would use, uh, they would go by a flying boat typically. Also because they could land anywhere. You didn't actually need an airport was um, a huge advantage. My mum remembers, um, she was born in 1942. She remembers in the in the late 50s, uh, a bit earlier when she was a kid, um, going down and watching the flying boats uh, arrive by the bay in Brisbane and celebrities coming to visit and whatnot. So they could carry rather more people. The very significant thing was that they could fly quite high. The altitude ceiling is really important. If you fly low, it's really, really rough. If you get up a lot higher, it's um, much more stable. The Lockheed constellation is the transformative plane on this. We see the passenger numbers increase somewhat. Uh, the range is very significant and quite strikingly, it can fly very high. So it wasn't a very pleasant experience um, flying before you could get up to that kind of altitude. If you wanna see a discussion of this, actually, if you watch the film, The Aviator, um, which is about Howard Hughes, um, hugely interesting film in, in, in various ways. Um, and there is a, a clear depiction of the pitch being brought by the Lockheed staff to him to say, okay, look, you know, we've got this new technology, can we do this? And he quite explicitly says, oh, thank you. know That, that um, altitude ceiling is really good because it's rough as hell up there. And uh, no, no one, unless they're really desperate is going to, uh, to pay money to have that experience. Um, and this is, this is transformational. So of course the 707 becomes a really striking thing. It can fly even higher. The passenger numbers are, are a lot higher. This is, this is what really makes mass air transport viable. And then the really transform, transformative one is the Boeing 747. Um, many of them being decommissioned now. Um, for me as a kid, um, flying to, to go internationally, the dream was to get on a 747. I, I never, I never went on a um, international flight until I was 19 years old. It was, you know, when I was young, it was quite an expensive thing to do. Um, and uh, we're just seeing this coming to, uh, coming to an end. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I had a flight back last year on Qantas from Sydney with one of the last of their 747s and they were going to decommission them this year anyway. And with Corona, they uh, sped up that process. The Concorde was absolutely dramatic because of the time that it saved. 
um, but it was hugely costly and it's no longer used because of a tragic crash at uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport. Okay, and then the uh, the 380, the scale of it, although the problem is the uh, they're so big that actually many of them are now parked in a desert in Nevada. And there's a real question about whether they will be returned or not. Um, although in the air industry, in the, in the um, passenger jet industry, they absolutely love them. Um, just simply because of the stability, the uh, the cabin experience, and whatnot. So, what does all all add up to in terms of connecting America to um, uh, Europe, the old world? Okay, um, crossing by airship, uh, 81 hours. Seaplane, it came down to 14 hours. So, this was quite significant in coordinating the war effort between the allies, you know, the, the British and the Americans um, during World War II, um, although one was always in danger of being shot down by uh, enemy fighters and whatnot, okay? And um, we see very significantly though, ships, ships don't just die as tran uh, transport. Uh, they become more and more efficient. And so still uh, the vast majority of people who traveled internationally uh, even into the 1960s, actually traveled by ship. It was still cheaper. Um, it took some time, but it, be, it became dramatically quicker. The transatlantic journey was down to three and a half days, um, crossing the, uh, the Atlantic from six days um, back in 1910. So incremental improvements in technology make a huge difference. So we don't want to fall into the trap of just thinking disruption is something that bang, um, suddenly comes with brand new technology, okay? And so here are the airplanes we see. Obviously, uh, military developments drove a lot of the innovation, but then the, uh, the applications to uh, business subsequently. So a little bit about the firm, British Origins. We've talked a lot about this. Um, I really don't need to, to linger on this. The textbook has, has spoken a lot about it. Historically, the corporation needed royal assent, then parliamentary approval. These became streamlined, um, devolved to a public agency, very significantly competition between the US uh, colonies to attract investment was the driver of the innovation here. And then that feeds back into um, innovation in the corporate form in the UK um, with the law really catching up in the 1860s. And we see similarly the adoption of limited liability as we've already kind of talked about in the text and had qu quizzes on it. Um, what I really want to emphasize here is, is more US, um, American uniqueness in terms of the politics of more corporate governance and how companies stand in relation to society. What's distinctive in the US is we don't have very clear cut class-based political action, okay? Uh, it's very clear, for example, blue collar workers um, being won over to Donald Trump to the Republicans shows how populism can cut across class divides. Um, in other countries, you, there, this, this does happen as well. The right sometimes reaches out to dispossess working class voters. Yeah, arguably that happened in Brexit and uh, to aspirational blue collar workers, sometimes conservative parties do very, very well politically in pitching to them, but the basic divides tend to be somewhat class-based with labor parties and whatnot. But there are significant reasons why this isn't the case in the US. Um, race being an absolutely fundamental one. A division of interests between um, black and white is one factor. Uh, one of the ugly elements we see, for example, and it's mentioned in your text in relation to the rise of American business, is the bringing in of African American workers as strike breakers uh, to undermine white unions, for example. And um, uh, black workers reconcile themselves to this role because uh, often uh, racial prejudice amongst white workers saw black members not admitted to union, black workers not admitted to unions in some cases, for example. So these racial cleavages cut across class cleavages. Uh, where political activists with, say, the Democrats, um, the labor movement become politically strong, particularly in southern states, is their ability to actually reach across the, uh, the racial divide, but that's often been very, very difficult. Um, then there's the whole American dream thing that we get. You know, the, the story of Andrew Carnegie comes across dirt poor, forced to work at 13, becomes one of the wealthiest men in America, um, and then gives the vast bulk of his money away. Um, these are stories about what you can you can do in America, and you know the old only in America 
which is often used in an ironic sense as well. But also very significantly, we see that uh, governments do turn against overly large um, companies that politicians, particularly say uh, Theodore Roosevelt, very strikingly, McKinley was pro-business, but then he was assassinated. And um, uh, Theodore Ro Roosevelt, on the one hand, appealing to nationalism, got into various military conflicts with Mexico and whatnot, um, but significantly wanted to break up the huge combines, um, the huge conglomerates uh, to provoke uh, more competition amongst firms, which was seen as delivering the benefits of a dynamic capitalist system to uh, consumers. Um, what this also means is we've got this complicated situation, which we'll come back to later on, that when companies grow very large and have got lots of shareholders, the ownership of con and control issues become problematic. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a video very specifically about this. Um, so that's sustainable. Uh, where in other societies where unions become quite powerful, management often give in to the unions. And so you then get strong reactions to that from shareholders. But I'll talk further about that point later on. Um, what we do see is in some sectors, unions are quite strong, autos, transport, um, the uh, uh, road transport, but also air transport, sea transport and whatnot. And um, management very often does kick the can down the road in terms of giving into the unions um, to avoid strikes and then foisting a lot of costs onto the firm with a whole bunch of unfunded future liabilities. And this is something I'll explain later on. Um, so a critical thing with, with um, the discussion of the American firm, and we'll come back to this later on too, when we talk about managerial capitalism, the, uh, the next chapter up that you've got to look at uh, really explores these issues. Um, the whole status of the question of minority shareholders, why would you buy into a company that you can't effectively uh, control yourself, okay? Uh, this led to concerns about ownership without power. That's a very famous turn of phrase. Uh, this has been a major factor in, in uh, minor pushing legally for minority shareholder protections, for demanding better corporate governance to make sure that managers are actually acting in the interests of the, we call it the principles, the shareholders, the fragmented principles, the many diverse shareholders. And um, we see various mechanisms of attenuating this problem of principal agent. A lot of it comes about through the rise of the big institutional investors. And again, I'll, I'll go and do a short video about that, for example. So minority, as I say here, minority shareholder oriented corporate governance has a lot of economic and political imperatives. And we'll talk about that later on. I'm also gonna talk uh, in more detail in the video very specifically about corporate control. It's something that's been filmed and just needs to be edited and uploaded like many other things. Okay, and apology for the delay on that. Um, America has a very dynamic market for corporate control. This is very much part of American capitalism DNA. The, uh, the chapter you would have been reading on the rise of the American firm for the last quiz talks a lot about how initially manufacturing firms, the owners were very wary about listing them publicly. Later on, they recognized the advantages of actually being able to sell out that way and to raise additional capital. And uh, we see that particularly the mergers and acquisitions dynamic. Uh, when someone like JP Morgan, who gets his start with his father's financial business and his father's friends, um, who, he, who he starts working for, uh, plays a key role in taking controlling stakes in a range of companies and putting them together effectively, bringing new combinations, creating, uh, creating conglomerates, rationalizing enterprises. So very strong notion that efficiencies can be brought about through control events, buying up railway shares, taking 30 or 40 different fragmented railway companies and merging them into one uh, company, for example, and forcing efficiency gains, rationalization. Uh, Americans really do have a strong belief in this. At the same time, they know that you can end up with a um, very problematically large dominant firm as we see with US Steel that uh, JP Morgan has a game of golf with Andrew Carnegie, uh, agrees to buy Carnegie Steel for something like $450 million, 480, whatever it was, um, and uh, then takes some 20 other um, steel companies and effectively bundles them together with them with a couple of hundred, hundred other related firms, bundles them all in, in together in terms of this um, giant US steel 
where its capitalization is equal to something like two thirds of the GDP of the US economy in one year. And it creates this huge um, entity which then raises a whole lot of issues of um, competition and whatnot subsequently. So the notion of the hostile takeover um, is one of the clearest instances of an active market for corporate control. If managers are not running a company well, fragmented shareholders, someone else comes in and says the managers are doing a poor job here. If we get enough shares, we can sack the management, we can replace us, um, them with people who will better run this company. Uh, we can rationalize the business. And uh, this is also why we see a premium for control, that shareholders to sell out anticipate that the people buying it um, believe that there is extra value to be extracted from the business by running it better. And as a consequence, they want more money in the first place to, to sell the shares. So, and the, uh, the people who want to take over the firm anticipate these returns and are prepared to pay a higher price for the shares. So the hostile takeover and the premium for control are uh, seen in American capitalism as a measure of the health of a market for corporate control. But because of those competition concerns, we see that there are regulatory controls on takeovers, antitrust provisions, for example. A lot of it comes down to complicated technical issues about if we put these business together, how much will competition be actually diminished, okay? So economists have a significant role to play here in terms of um, what we call market dominance tests and whatnot. And that's a conversation um, I'll come back to later on in the course. Also, there's lots of sectoral specific regulation, you know, things like airlines, medicine, whole range of things, you know, pharmaceuticals. There are very important issues of, you know, public welfare involved. So we really want to regulate how companies conduct themselves. Um, sometimes regulation actually impacts on the very structure of the industry. Um, in the Japanese case, how many mobile phone licenses are issued, you know, mobile phone network licenses are issued. Uh, governments are making some kind of judgments about the optimum level of infrastructure. Uh, we know again from the from the video material in the textbook that if you've got two railway lines running next to each other, it's actually quite inefficient. Um, is it better to have a monopoly with just one railway line? Uh, but then how do they uh, how do we make sure they don't abuse their market position by putting prices up too high? Then we have to start regulating the um, the actual conduct of the uh, the players if we're not regulating the, the structure, how many can be, or if we're doing both. Uh, so in so many fields, these issues arise. Uh, sometimes you also have restrictions on takeovers in relation to foreign investment in some sectors. So the critical thing in the American context is how to get managers acting in the interests of shareholders. And this is something you'll see discussed in the next chapter you have to read um, on managerial capitalism. Significant thing is in large incentive compensation to try and overcome the agency problem, to try and get the managers who can be managers because they're smart, maybe they went to business school or wherever they went to school, you know, they, they got a scholarship, they went to university, um, they demonstrated their, their capability working for the firm, they've risen all the way up to the top top management, how do we make sure that they manage the firm in their own, in, in uh, the interests of the shareholders, not in their own interests, not in their own interests, okay. Um, so what we want them to do is to kind of think like shareholders because the shareholders own the business. So the best way to do that is to actually give them incentives that are actually tied to how uh, the shares in the firm go. So this is the, uh, the bonus arrangements that are typically tied to a strike price for the shares. So to get them to think, feel and act like the shareholders. Now, of course, if you don't accept the premise that the shareholders own the firm, then of course this looks bad, but very clearly in the American case, the company is understood as the property of the shareholders. And there's a lot of very clear logic for that. Um, and when there's no large single shareholder um, who is disciplining management, who gets to choose who's on the board and therefore force board members to actually discipline management. Uh, when there is fragmented, the problem of fragmented principles, this becomes all the more important. So when we look at those huge bonuses paid to top managers, particularly share options and whatnot, and it looks extreme in the American case, we must remember two things. First of all, that are interrelated. The sheer scale of American businesses, American firms tend to be much bigger in the first place. 
And secondly, the shareholders tend to be much more diffused. So it's kind of like turning the management into quasi shareholders. But of course, everyone else who works for the firm says, how come those typically guys, but sometimes women too, but how come those folks um, are getting such a sweet deal and we don't? And that statistic we had early on in the course that showed the ratio of CEO compensation to uh, the average employee's compensation is extreme in the American case. Um, but historically, the scale of business and the fragmented nature of shareholding, um, particularly after World War II, uh, all factors um, in this. So let me stop that there, have a quick sweep. Now, I want to um, just draw your attention to a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, I've started, uh, I just put the first one up, but I'm, I'm doing the, um, all the back videos, uh, the recordings of the live sessions are all going up on the website I put up uh, last week's. Um, I go through and I, if we've done a breakout room like we did last week, I edit every, all the students out. So it's only me. Okay. Um, and I actually, the debrief section, when I talked about all the lessons, um, uh, your contributions that you found in the, in the breakout session. I edited that out too, because I did a silly thing. Um, when I was talking, um, the video capture captures the, what I'm seeing in my screen as a whole, but I actually like to, uh, look at the, um, gallery view and see who's there and, and, and whatnot and reduce myself. I don't really like seeing on a 27 inch iMac me, um, as I'm seeing now, which is kind of, you know, how old and horrible I look, but shall we know? Um, and I absolutely simply forgot that the video capture actually doesn't, uh, capture the speaker view. Uh, so it captures the gallery view. So I was just this little talking head and, um, there are a whole bunch of people tiled there and every now and again someone had their camera come on and off so i don't want to have um people captured in videos without the permission so i'm kind of cutting you all out of that so it's only me uh so it's a bit of a mechanical process so where i've had the um mostly the uh, sh share screen with the um lecture notes and whatnot that's that's a lot easy to edit up and all of those are going to go up a um, whole bunch of other videos are going to go up for the next uh day or two uh, but a couple other things I want to show, and um, particularly, first of all, the disruption exercise, um, and a simple reminder that you guys should be connecting with your group members as soon as possible. Now, um, this is the course site, as you know it here, okay? So the group disruption, uh, disruption group project here, um, you can find it there and we click it there. Da, 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 da. Okay. So, and we go to here, task description, bang, there you go. So super easy. Um, hopefully you've already all uh, looked at that. Okay. Um, now that's open as a separate document. So you're not gonna see it there. Now let me come back to here. And now what I really want to emphasize is here, these group forums, when you come down to here, um, your group list is here. Hopefully you've all found your group members already. Um, again, you just click on that there, bang, there we go. But you can't see it now because it just opened automatically. Um, what I want to emphasize here is the group forums. I did encourage people to look early and make contact with their groups. I click on here and, oh, I can see exactly who these very um, eager people who've reached out to their group members and connected. I can see you here. Thank you very much for your timely engagement. And I can see the replies. So uh, this group here, thank you very much. Group two, you guys are very, um, you're getting with the project, okay? Um, so three out of four of you have kind of connected there already. Um, I'm seeing some other groups. Uh, group five, fantastic. Arkady and others, thank you very much. Um, Lisa and whatnot. Um, both of you did very well in your quizzes too. I'm delighted to see. Uh, there's always a very strong correlation, actually. So people who are doing better on the quizzes tend to be uh, more active in these groups. So wonderful. Uh, Mike Maho and more as well. So actually, yes. Um, 
there's a very powerful correlation between the names I'm seeing here and how well people are doing on the quizzes. Well, wow, okay, yeah, okay. Um, uh, so those of you who don't even realize that this is available, get to it, okay? This is your starting point. Now you can subsequently go on, you know, you can go to line however you want to connect and make it work, okay? Um, I really want to emphasize with the uh, group, see me say this, with the group project, uh, those of you talking introduction to business in the spring know this, that there is a uh, peer evaluation mechanism. And so at the end of it, uh, you get to review all your group members contribution and um, you uh, submit that to me uh, directly. So I, I place a very significant weighting on that. Um, and indeed the, uh, the group project can end up even kind of messy, um, but I still make sure that those people have really tried to salvage it and really engage with it. They're still up there getting their, their A plus or, or A or whatever they deserve, okay? Um, so that's absolutely uh, vital there. Um, we uh, have a solid month to work on this and um, my rule of thumb, people know this, have taken other classes that I tend to give groups about five weeks in total in a month to five weeks. If we start these things too early, then um, people just completely lose momentum and it just gets really, really messy. Um, and in the world at large, generally the, the kind of the one month project, whether it's a market research project or whatever, tends to be the, uh, the optimal kind of time frame. Not too little uh, because people have got contending schedules, but too long and it just um, kind of dies. Uh, so the uh, the product itself, uh, all of those things are described um, in here. And as advertised, I'm going to do a breakout session in period five today. So anyone who wants to ask questions, you can drop in at your convenience anytime in period five and um, can ask me there. Okay, so do make uh, full use of that. And if you want to talk about uh, other things as well, then very um, happy to talk to you there. So now let's turn to um, a discussion of British enterprise. There's so many windows open here, I've got to find them. Now this is fairly brief again, because um, it kind of mirrors the conversation of the textbook and I've tried to add to it with some graphics and whatnot. It's important context what I'm going to talk about in terms of set the capitalism next week. Um, I'm going to put some video material together to cover some of the other stuff on, on the Japanese case. Um, but we're also going to come back to Japan repeatedly later on in the course um, with uh, through case studies of particular issues. So it's not that I'm downplaying the Japanese case far, far from it. Um, it'll be a major prism for looking about all the more thematic issues as we're dealing with the, uh, the course. So, okay, a um, couple of things to emphasize. Uh, the role of capitalism in improving the lot of workers, okay? Uh, this is something that's best looked at yourself. Um, with some very strange red squig squiggly line. I don't know where that's coming from. Okay, um, very significantly, before we ever get to industrialization, what we see is trade is a major driver of improvement of individual workers' uh, lives, incomes and whatnot. And if we look at these charts here, you can see very significantly from 1409 through to 1784. So really before the industrial revolution, um, quite substantial differences in terms of real wages in European cities, okay? Um, this is very sophisticated um, economic historical work and building this data is, is, is a mind boggling exercise. They, they gather a vast array of historical documents to try and figure out what the cost of living was, what people were paid, you know, they go to museums and find old um, wage books and uh, whatnot. So we can see that this um, kind of brown line um, up the top here, okay, uh, London quite strikingly and Antwerp, these top two, so they kind of change places and whatnot. Uh, for a very long time, for many, many centuries, um, London was a relatively prosperous place. Antwerp was as well. Uh, and this becomes even more clear cut uh, over time. Uh, by contrast, Paris, which is this light blue line, is declining for a significant period of time. Now, there are various reasons for this. I'm not going to get too much in the economic history of it, but um, it's kind of 
no surprise that you end up with a uh, a revolution because of the, uh, the the diminishing relative welfare of labor workers in the french case okay and so that helps to ferment uh rebellion quite significantly various european cities and whatnot are uh, depicted here so anyway london was a quite a prosperous place uh, in terms of what happens with GDP per capita, uh, this was held constant in 1960 terms. This is a very famous bit of um, uh, academic investigation to, to kind of assemble these, these kinds of figures, okay? And what we see is um, back in 1830 already, Britain was a relatively more prosperous place and the differential becomes uh, larger over time. Uh, France started uh, poorer in terms of GDP per capita. The gap expands over time because France is a relative laggard in terms of industrialization. Now, France does catch up in certain places and actually France becomes a very significant industrial economy as well. Um, Austro the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, as we can see, much more flat lines. There is a little bit of a pickup. There are some pockets of industrialization in uh, places like Bohemia and uh, whatnot. Um, Italy as well, kind of flat lines and Russia pretty consistently a poorer place. Um, of course, with the uh, uh, power of steam to drive so many machines and, uh, and whatnot, that really tr this, is, this is the critical thing with the industrial uh, revolution that uh, you need coal to, that's the, the most efficient power source for steam engines. One advantage of steam engines is you can burn a whole bunch of things in them, but the, uh, the most efficient thing to do is to use coal. So what we tend to see is um, co-location where you can access the raw material for various things like the, um, the mills of say Lancashire, the textile mills, uh, they're relatively close to the sources of wool, for example, um, but also there were these significant coal fields. So you didn't have to haul the coal too far. You didn't have to bring the other raw materials too far. Um, we do see some use of uh, river transport to move and, and uh, particularly coastal collier, literally it's a type of ship, uh, to carry coal down to places like uh, London. But for the most part, the early development of industry follows coal um, in the UK, okay? And we see a very significant increase in terms of the relative share of world manufacturing output. Uh, the UK obviously grows enormously. Um, Germany starts relatively small, but has a very substantial um, process of industrialization, capturing large scale manufacturing uh, capabilities, very effective catch up. Uh, quiz question very specifically there what what makes germany so dynamic really strong emphasis on technical education is a major factor um cooperation with emerging uh trade unions otto von bismarck who unifies germany also emphasizes social democracy and a kind of a collaborative relationship with labor um and that's partly because of a bit of a nationalistic twist as well you know that um that uh, the whole notion of the uh, the Volk of the German people, everyone had to be kind of brought along with the uh, the national project. So a more um, what, unified national approach to industrialization. And particularly as well, the respect for a managerial class is very significant and the education of managers. As the textbook mentions, we see that the, uh, the development of business skills, for example, um, in Germany and in France are quite advanced along with um, the US. Britain, on the other hand, is a real laggard. And uh, that's what I briefly want to touch on here. Um, in terms of industrial production surging and whatnot, building rail railways, growth of population, all of those things we can, we can see uh, through those details. I just want to really emphasize briefly several periods of political economy. Um, Historically, Britain was very uh, laissez-faire, French, kind of leave to be free, um, business environments in the world, and embraced free trade, abolished restrictions on imported cheap grain, for example, which smashed the old Tories, the old agricultural interests. Uh, economically, they really suffered um, in favor of the emerging manufacturing interests. So, so class politics are very significant here. 
So while government policy favours industrial interests, culturally, Britain still stays very attached to its rural identity, its traditional class system and whatnot, even though its, its economic policy settings are upsetting that um, in a strange way. This is, this is one of the strange paradoxes of Britain, that it kind of reconciles itself to the dynamics of market forces, partly because of the British Empire and the huge returns to trade that came from the sheer scale of the British Empire was attractive. Um, effectively, uh, the economic dynamism of empire and free trade was, it was going to have social, cultural and political consequences. It created the new wealthy. Uh, Britain's success and its weakness is kind of integrating the new wealthy into old status systems. Unfortunately, that draws people's energies away from continuing to cultivate business. Um, what we see is effectively the great competitive advantage longer term for London. The way they reconcile this is actually with the city of London. So center of finance, um, still today, the arguably the city of London is even more important than New York in terms of its global funding um, functions. Uh, the English legal system, for example, becomes the benchmark for international contract. This helps to explain why the even the the kids of successful business entrepreneurs tend they when they go to university they tend to go and study uh, law or economics and then they get a job in the city or they get a job as a lawyer rather than continuing the uh, the family business uh, they'd have the uh, the effectively some of the status benefits and um, some of the the, the trappings of ye old England. Um, I've, one of my old university friends, I've visited him in time when I'm in London. Um, he's a barrister um, and um, he's in Lincoln Inn uh, where his, his chambers are. And uh, he takes me to lunch there. And the dining room, for example, there um, is actually where they uh, figured as a dining room in uh, one of the movies for... Um, Harry Potter, and um, I think it was Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, I think it was, or Mid Midsummer Night's Dream, one of the two. Anyway, it actually debuted in that room, okay? So, you know, you really feel part of something very old, very, very tradition-bound, literally by uh, being in central London, being a barrister, being a lawyer, um, and if you're in the city, you, you're in not, not much of a walk away from some of the, 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 the trappings of um, all that's best and best of British, arguably. <coughs> but um, the downside of this, of course, is that you get less focus on celebration of business as, and, and creating business and, and, and cultivating business as a goal in itself, uh, as we see in the American sense. And so, uh, very powerful conclusions drawn by those two authors um, in a, of our text, one who was the editor of The Economist, you know, the iconic British um, magazine, which, which talks and has always championed the benefits of free trade and entrepreneurship and whatnot. So the editor and one of their leading writers who wrote our textbook, they both say that effectively um, in the first half of the 20th century, at least, um, if you make it in business, you then use your money to buy a nice country house, to get yourself into a nice gentleman's club, and you try and adopt all the, the trappings of um, old aristocratic wealth and semi-rural lifestyle and whatnot. Um, we also see the political parties and particularly the Tories um, conflicted on this that the Tories, of course, are very strongly supported by business as well, too. And yet the uh, the Tories quite explicitly, if you look at their, their history, have very much roots in um, agricultural interests and uh, old old elites. And uh, so particularly the not not the highest of their uh, aristocrats over the Whigs, which pretty much disappeared kind of politically. But so some of the policy settings, for example, whether the pound is strong or weak has a big impact. So a strong pound was been very helpful, was very helpful for uh, the city of London, much less helpful for uh, industrial exporters, for example. So Brexit issues raises a lot of um, distributional kind of consequences. 
So founding families in Britain, despite the, uh, the notion that we have this relatively free market for corporate control and companies being listed on the stock market and they can sell out and all the rest of it, founding families often played a, a long ongoing important role in business. Tax reasons and whatnot is one factor here. Um, so there is a bit of a paradox that the family families kind of, founding families kept control um, even while there was a degree of stigma involved in being in business. The UK definitely had the earliest, most sophisticated stock markets. And the dominance of London as a finance center is indelibly tied to the scale of both the British empire, but even more significantly, what we saw in America. Those incredibly dynamic American industrial enterprises, the great American industrial and settlement project was in its early days funded by British capital, recycled British capital, a lot of um, British wealth was generated through investment uh, in America. Um, JP Morgan was one of the very clear early instances uh, of um, providing a mechanism for channeling British capital into American business. His father ran the investment fund in London and his son was the, uh, the New York kind of representative of it and uh, then partnered with people like Drexel family and whatnot to do this. So the prosperity of the city of London is indelibly tied to developments in the new world, the United States, but also beyond the United States and, and beyond the British empire as well. For example, the, the uh, development of the coffee industry in Brazil was overwhelmingly funded by British capital. The coffee was overwhelmingly exported towards uh, American markets. So there's very multilateral uh, trade that we see. So in, in terms of British business, we don't see the full clear separation of ownership and control as happened in the US, partly because the firms don't scale up to the same degree. Right up until the 1980s, often the founding families remained influential block holders, which is a little bit unusual from an American perspective. And we see that this has often had a negative impact on business. So the families kept control of the business, but they, they didn't really have their heart in it. So it's very chew to humper in a sense. Um, Roe, and we'll, we'll talk about Roe's work later on. He talks about uh, comparative politics of corporate governance. He emphasizes that really, this is 20th century UK politics of factors in this. Um, inheritance taxes were very steep, for example, um, particularly they were, they were raised by the uh, Labour government after World War II. Um, trade unions, a whole range of factors, Labour militancy uh, means that People who've got business interests tend to hang on to them, costly to exit. Uh, they don't want to dilute the control. They fear their managers will give in to unions and further diminish the wealth of the, uh, the family enterprise, even while they're um, uh, not particularly passionate about the business in the first place, okay? Um, so a key theme in the British case is the rise of laborism. I mean, in some sense, we have to think of America as more the exception. This is not unusual. This happens, uh, this rise of laborism happens as well in um, continental Europe in slightly different ways, uh, but particularly strong in the UK. And we see the British Labour Party and then uh, example prompted by it, formation of the Australian Labour Party in New Zealand and in other places as well. And so these become major uh, political forces in uh, societies influenced by the UK. So effectively strong trade unions and then the British Labour Party is created when the, the unions fail to get what they want through industrial action, particularly in the um, early uh, 1890s, there is depression in the US as well. Um, management is more powerful in relation to labour. Also management and the owners of businesses tend to befriend politicians and state forces uh, the police, for example, used to break strikes. And so then this notion amongst labor leaders that they have to take control of the state through a political movement. The main thing that holds that back is the right to vote. And so universal suffrage, extending the right to vote to everybody is a critical thing. Uh, this took a long time in the UK. Uh, there was always a property requirement that you had to own a certain amount of property before you had the right to vote. That also excluded women who were excluded from ownership of property. And so the suffragette movement to bring rights to vote to women were very significant. Um, it's only after World War I that the right, there is a universal right to vote um, introduced. 
by the way, the world, the first place in the world to have equal rights to vote for everyone, regardless of property or gender, was actually the colony of South Australia. And um, then New Zealand came close after. In fact, the New Zealanders reckon they're ahead of South Australia, but they're wrong. Uh, again, a very significant story that political developments, business developments are happening in the new world and then coming back and influencing the old world. It's not a one-way export. Um, of these models. It is a very significant kind of feedback mechanism. Critical thing is World War I and World War II both give very strong weight to organized labor. The massive sacrifice, the massive loss of life in the trenches of World War I um, for national, national purposes, um, the, the loss of, of well over a million young men's lives um, of all classes, makes it just politically indefensible for people to not have the vote. So it simply says, you know, if I can die in a die in a stinking rotten trench in a field in France, then I should be able to vote for the government that actually um, would send me to war in the first place. After World War II, similar kind of thing, a national struggle and this, this notion that the economy should work for everyone. But unfortunately, what we see is that actually many firms are actually quite run down through World War II. They need to be recapitalized um, and whatnot. And uh, militant unions as well. And we often, we, we get a process of nationalization where government takes over a lot of enterprises. The Thatcher's revolution, um, Margaret Thatcher uh, really undoes some post-war British politic, uh, policies, uh, strong laborist oriented policies, for example, post-1979, privatizations, market liberalizations, influence of um, financial interests in the city, um, tax system reforms, welfare system reforms, often quite, quite ungenerous. Um, very, this is, we see a very significant divergence from the Scandinavian model of, which we'll talk about subsequently, of freer markets, but strong social welfare mechanisms to support people. So the kind of the Tory political model um, in many ways um, is, a, is, a, is a quite ungenerous one. And so there's, there's a real legacy of kind of um, bitterness there. But in terms of the transformation of ownership of enterprise, effectively what we see is a lot of the barriers to uh, founding families selling down their stake in businesses are uh, removed, the tax barriers and whatnot. And as a consequence, we get increased separation of ownership and control. Um, this leads to greater pressure for better corporate governance, particularly because the UK is a primary center for listing businesses, listing enterprises, um, having the shares traded on the stock market. Uh, and tax treatment tends to drive this. For example, you can buy the same investment fund listed on say the, uh, the Frankfurt Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange, but if you buy it through London, the withholding tax, for example, for a non um, UK or the non EU resident is kind of lower. So a lot of money from throughout the world flowed into the UK Stock Exchange and then this raised issues about corporate governance standards um, and whatnot. So just simply to finish up on this point, um, what we see throughout the Anglo-American world, although there are significant differences between the US, the UK, and we'll talk a little bit about Australia and New Zealand and Canada and whatnot, um, there is a very strong notion of shareholder wealth maximization. You know, that the ultimately the company is owned by its shareholders and should act in the interests of shareholders subject to community expectations. Okay, strongest in the US, um, Milton Friedman, real champion of free enterprise, uh, uh, Chicago school, liberal economist from the, the US. He said the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. And a lot of people you know, hate Milton Friedman because he said this, but he had a quite sophisticated argument that he said that um, the, it's the role of government to decide what uh, impositions it's going to impose on a firm in terms of social responsibility. So the government sets those standards, sets those rules, those obligations. Within that context, management should be focused on maximizing shareholder value. And of course, complying with the law, paying work as well, if that's what the law requires, is part of the calculation of management. And this meets this requirement, therefore, to have a decision rule that uh, effectively a business should be run in the interests of its shareholders. The Thatcher years lent strong support to this. 
what we see is when we talk about continental Europe, that um, it's a rather different kind of dynamic. And I'm going to make a, uh, a video about that, but I'm also going to present some of it um, in the next live session next week as well. Now, strikingly, the Thatcher revolution uh, spreads out and has influenced other places. Ronald Reagan is influenced by this. Um, in, Australia, in Australia and New Zealand, they uh, pick up the model. But what is really significant, and we'll talk about this next week, Australia and New Zealand both have labor governments, which bring about market-based reforms. So they really champion a model of market uh marketization for social democracy and that's not inconsistent in fact it brings us quite close to the scandinavian model uh which we will talk about in uh subsequent weeks so the embrace of uh neoliberalism should not be assumed to be just a right wing thatcherite reaganite agenda um, indeed, one of the, uh, the most striking lessons from the mid to late 1980s is that many social democratic countries that have actually had very su sustained economic growth and high levels of entrepreneurship subsequently really did embrace neoliberalism in the mid 1980s. So it's fashionable now to decry neoliberalism, but a lot of people kind of miss these fundamental points um, because there's one fundamental takeaway, and this is why I've bolded at the end and just got to where I want to finish. Um, when you emphasize shareholder value norms, there is a quid pro quo, okay? The company is there for shareholders, but you don't get any help from the government, okay? The firms have to face the disciplines of the market. And if the firm fails, the shareholders lose their money, that's their problem, okay? So don't come to the state looking for favors. We'll see is when states impose many more expectations on firms, very often firms come back and want to get help from the state as well. You know, so they say, okay, no, you don't want us to close this factory because you don't want people to lose their jobs. Okay, the, the government can argue that. Well, the government should give us some protection from foreign competition so that we can afford to keep this factory open. Okay, so a different kind of quid pro quo. So we have to take very seriously this neoliberal agenda um, but we can't cherry pick. Business interests will always argue for free markets when it suits them, but turn around and want protection when it suits them as well too. Um, likewise, the other way around, labor interests and whatnot. So we'll leave it there. Um, make sure to connect with your groups and um, I will be here Zooming. Uh, the login details are already on announcements there. So if you wanna come by period five virtually and ask me um, anything you want to about the project, that is great. And uh, we will also have, of course, a, another breakout session um, next Wednesday. Uh, sorry, sorry, a, a drop-in session on Wednesday as well. So if you can't connect with your group members um, this afternoon to then come and ask me questions, certainly use that session that we will have uh, period three next Wednesday uh, to really clarify your direction with what you're gonna do with the uh, disruption project. So thank you and uh, not such a beautiful day this today, but the autumn colors are nice. So enjoy. Thank you.